Oh, this is the huge tip. I will switch this before doing the next one. Yeah, I got this box of these D-Link cloud-connected cameras, and these are actually for a class that some of my coworkers are doing soon, and I'm helping them out with some hardware modifications. So I'm doing a little bit of prep work so that the students in the class can just attach a UART to some exposed pins without having to go soldering on the circuit board. Huh, there's a magnet here. Here's the cloud camera we're dealing with. Kind of protective lens over the actual lens opening. It's interesting. Nice brass insert for the tripod mount. So it looks like it probably just snaps open around the edges. You can feel kind of an indentation there. Maybe that is a molding defect the seam. Uh, sorry, little snaps. <laughs> Yay. I guess with a device this integrated, that's probably an entire SOC. And I mean, that would explain it being connected to what appears to be some external DRAM. <laughs> There's a wire. Ooh, that's for the IR illuminator, it looks like. ICR? Oh man, that is totally an active IR filter. That was worth taking apart. Yeah, so we're kind of, that is like a photodiode sensor, I guess. So this circuit's probably an amplifier for that. I assume they're using this to detect sunlight, but I wonder if you could also use this to pick up modulated signals. Oh, that definitely switched it. Nice. That seems to be the camera processor. This little bus brings the raw image data over to this chip, which is probably doing the compression. And it's probably kind of a general purpose camera front end like you'd find in a webcam. That looks like a switching power supply. There's some serial flash wind bond. There's one debug header. Power off. Uh, we're on. Ooh, look at that. Good data. That is a slightly different connector than what we had on the other model, but at least it doesn't seem like they actually made it any harder. It seems like I could just go in with the hot knife, like right here, or even possibly a drill press. So I think I might do one of these just with the whole thing disassembled like this, but with an eye toward it fitting in a case that's been very minimally disassembled. And then I'll see if I can do the rest of them without actually even having to take the case apart, because that might be the most time-consuming part of the process, even. Yeah, Phil in chat points out that the drill press leaves a lot of plastic chips, which is definitely annoying. The hot knife avoids that. And the Dremel, I don't know, I feel like the Dremel is kind of the worst of both worlds for this, because you'll end up melting the plastic, and you'll end up getting dust and chips everywhere, and you'll probably end up breaking a few uh, cutting blades. This is kind of like the most disgusting cake. I might just not worry about making the hole super small and make it a little bigger. So, looks a lot like a screwdriver, but there's a little hole in the end that you stick over a wire pin, and then there's an even littler hole next to the edge that you stick some uh, 30 gauge wire in, and it helps you twist it around the middle wire. You can see the result of the wire wrapping. I really don't have a better way of stripping 30 gauge wire than this thing, which is a little annoying. I know I used to, when I did a bunch of wire wrap, I had this little tiny little metal thing that was just like a little sharp piece of sheet metal. <laughs> it didn't really look like a wire stripper, but it worked all right for 30 gauge. So this provides power, which we want to ignore. Black is ground. White is receive in. Green is transmit out. Okay. And power. So I just restarted the power. It's 57600 baud. There's the bootloader. So let's see if we actually get a shell. That'll test communication both directions. <laughs> a non-compliant UVC driver. Well, it looks like it has pretty standard Linux video drivers for the camera. This might be a fun little platform to hack around on. End of internet.sh. <laughs> no pan tilt. Oh, and it drops you right into a root shell? 
It has top installed, UVC stream. Actually, it smells more like a laser cutter than a 3D printer. Since, you know, 3D printers usually don't quite get this hot. This box has all the ones that have been cut, but no other modifications. So, I think only one of these has been tested, and of course none of them have the header epoxied on. So I, I soldered the Kynar wire wrapping wire to the board on that side, but then on the header side, I actually just used a wire wrapping tool. And that was okay, but I don't really have the proper stri wire stripper tool for that. I think I used to, but I don't anymore, and my regular wire stripper is just super slow at stripping this kind of wire. So I was thinking that I would try an alternative and see if it would be faster to use the solder pot to just bulk prep a bunch of small wires, um, and this time to use magnet wire so that I can just burn off the insulation. All right. So let's see. Oh yeah, so this is a little dusty. It might smoke a little when I turn it on. Um, and there are obviously plenty of other ways to do it. I mean, the most uh, kind of the f most expedient way to do this would be to have a, uh, a wiring harness manufactured that fits this original connector and to buy some of those connectors. Um, but this is a little more like the kind of general purpose technique you would usually use in some unknown hardware like this. So, all right. So I'm dipping this in a little bit of flux. That was not quite enough time to melt the insulation. The flux also doesn't really seem to stick until the insulation's burned off. I'm just gonna get like a cardboard tube and tape this to that and let's see how far that gets me. Okay, so now I've got this. I think the next thing I wanna do is mask off regions that I want to sand using some Kapton tape since it's pretty sturdy and thin. Yeah, the one, one thing that's kind of tricky about a solder pot relative to regular soldering is that you do have to supply all the flux separately, since of course you can't put flux in there because it would just burn immediately. <laughs> it's like a little bouquet that I've got to dip in molten metal. Seems to be f good enough and it's fast. Um, this does have a little bit of conductive debris attached to it. Um, but I think we're gonna be coating over most of this with epoxy anyway, so I'm not quite as worried about it. All right, let's see how we can go about this. I think the strategy was just to tin a bunch of these and then stick mm. wires on. Yeah, I know it might look like I just don't know how to use a soldering iron, but the, the right pin especially, and to some extent the left pin, are on really thick copper planes, so they um, they do not act nicely. They will just suck the heat away from the joint. So it takes a while. You have to just keep pumping heat in for a while until it starts to even want to solder correctly. But with this stuff pre-tinned, like, you can get lucky and it kind of works. That's not a great joint, but it'll be enough for magnet wire. And then the middle two are always easy. They're just RX and TX. They go on thin traces all the way around the board, and through a bunch of vias, and probably halfway around the board again. Yeah, it's much easier to burn off the insulation effectively and get a good joint when we don't also have the plane sucking heat away from you. A lot of these joints are not the best, but they only have to be better than the wire, which itself is not very strong, so. As long as they're making electrical contact and they pass a light pull test, then I'm happy with them. All right, I think this adventure is finally coming to a close. There's the uh, success of today, the pile of cameras modified, ready to go into the larger box where I'll ship them back out. Thanks for all of the support to all my patrons. 
thanks for you know tuning in and uh, until next time happy hacking